a very special guest, Chad Atkinson, who is a special effects artist. Amazing guy, has worked on so many amazing titles. The IMDb goes on forever, but some of the main highlights are Spiderhead, House of Inequity, Love and Monsters, The Mist, Hills of Eyes, Chronicles of Narnia, Hostel. Oh my gosh, Chad. Jesus. Yes. It goes on and on, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it really does. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. I've been wanting to talk to a special effects person for such a long time because I personally love it. I like to throw blood and gore into all my stuff. So. Yes. Um, I'd love to know where you got your start to begin with. Where did I got my start? Well, we can go all the way back into the Wayback Machine. So in high school, <clears throat> I was a big fan of horror films, yeah. and I was uh, a big fan of sci-fi. And uh, in a, in a, I did pretty well in, in art, but I didn't really have an avenue for anywhere to go. So I, I kind of took that path in you know, doing the art school sort of jam. And uh, found a college that taught art. It was a you know art school. And once I was in there, I was like, okay, what am I? What's my major going to be? And it became like illustration. Uh, I think a, a little bit of fine arts and sculpture and things like that. And then I started getting more and more interested in you know how is it going to be a commercial art sort of job that I'm going to do? So I mm. talked to a this is a very elongated sort of way of going about this, but I talked to a professor and I was like, what's my chances as this major of um, being an illustrator Yeah. of what's my chances of getting a job? And they're like, well, you can either come back into the circle and, you know, do this sort of world, you know, go deeper into university or you can go and work at this, this local place and be a designer like all the other sort of students are doing. Mm. And I always had this interest in horror films and sci-fi and a bit of theater. I never took theater, though. Um, but I was interested in it. And I was like, you know, what? I think there's got to be a way for me to do an, an arts world. So I was looking through my Fangoria magazines of all the things. And there was an ad in there for a, uh, uh, an institute called the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. And they have like these art institutes throughout the U.S. And I think there's like Seattle and Chicago, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. And there's a few others. Anyway, this particular school had a, a program under the industrial design um, uh, major. And they offered special effects as a course. And I was Ooh. like, I go, that's really interesting. And I just I was really kind of lost at this other art school so I was like I spoke to my folks and I was like Can you give me a hand here I want to go and explore this mm. ended up going there transferred my credits over most of them and did this two-year program and the program had some notable film workers um, from the Pittsburgh area they had Jerry Gurgley who worked for Tom Savini Tom Savini's the master of gore out of out of Pittsburgh he did um, Friday the 13th part four and Maniac and the creep show movies, all that those sort of things. So, you know, Tom Savini in Pittsburgh and Romero um are all from there. And in Greg Nicotero, um, as you know from The Walking Dead, they're all from Pittsburgh. So that's that's where I went. That's where I started my my journey. And so the some of the professors and well, teachers and instructors were film people. So mm. Jerry, there was this guy, uh Tom Sullivan, he was there. There was there was quite a few that if you ask them a question, yes, they had the answer, and it was because they worked on a film. They had that experience, and I thought that was so important. Yeah, to learn from the people that actually did the thing. Yeah, it's like you know, you're kind of like, well, this is the teachings. You you've been in the inside. You've been behind the camera. You know what's you know what they're looking for. Yeah. You know, and that's what you need. You can't. It can't be a guessing game, in my opinion. Anyway. I did pretty well at that school, um, graduated with their version of honors, I suppose, and traveled west from Pittsburgh to California in hopes to find a job. Mm. I had no prospects. I had no connections. It was me and my friend, Carrie Jones. Um, Carrie Jones, uh, he is now the supervisor for K&B Effects, the Walking Dead yes, uh, so cool. effects company. Yeah, so he, he's in the top echelon of that company. But he and I got into my little truck, drove across the uh, U.S., made it to San Francisco, nowhere near L.A., and had 800 bucks. And we, 
we starved and we were starving. Oh my God. Laying on, you know, we were sleeping on a floor, no couches, no nothing. We had nothing. We had a stack of magazines, which are Fangoria magazines. Uh, <laughs> Fangoria magazines are, you know, the horror rag, you know, the, the, the monthly rag for all the horror movies. And it had a section in there for special effects. Yeah. And sometimes there was some how to's in there too. So that was very important that we had our Fangorias and that's all we would read. We'd read, mm. that, we'd read that rag. And then we'd, the other time we would do is we would just write resumes and we went to LA and just dropped it off. Went to, we did a reconnaissance. We went, we found this um, phone booth and it had a big old like phone book in there. And we went to, special effects and the movies and whatever it was and just tore pages out. Literally we're tearing pages out of the white wow. pages and yellow pages. And we had all that. So we had phone numbers and we had addresses and we were just mapping out the city. And then this is pre digital pre, you know, yeah, it sounds all that like stuff. the starving artist hustlers right here. It, it was totally <laughs> a hustlers move. And yeah. we both had stacks that were, Oh, Oh my God. There must've been at least, 50 to 75 resumes that we were both sending out and what we would do is we'd send them out and we'd call and it was like you had to give it time because it wasn't immediate so you go send it out how, how long is it going to take to get there so you kind of guess and it takes about seven days it lands on someone's desk and then call and then you ca cold wow. call and he goes hey this is chad atkinson i just want to see if you got my resume are you guys hiring no we're not hiring at this time but we'll put your your resume on file Thank you very much. And we would do this and we would just loop this, both of us. And I got a, uh, I got a job in, if I needed a job. So I, I started working at this pet supply warehouse. I had never been a cashier before. I'd never been at anything before. Yeah, right? right. So I have no <laughs> skills that way. And, um, <laughs> and promptly got fired within a week of being in there. Oh gosh. Cause my till was <laughs> off like a hundred bucks. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, it was like a Sunday and I and I um panicked. There was somebody needed to return all this stuff and I just like I don't know. I, I had a panic. And they were well, like Well at least you were still a good human in that point. Yeah, I was still a good human and I was like I was apologetic and I was like, I really need the job, but I don't need this job. I need an excuse to get yeah, out of here. Right. And it kind of kicked the well, I didn't really need a, any kick to the pants to to drive. But um Carrie got a job first. Where'd he go? He had a job at Alterian Studios, Tony Gardner. And that job was the Batman and Robin movie. Oh, cool. Which is the worst movie, honestly. <laughs> like, a funny side note. Like, we went to the, that wasn't the screening. It was just the actual opening night. We didn't go to a cast crew screening. But we're like, oh, great, Carrie, you got to, you know, you got to. Seems pretty high level, though. Right. I mean, like straight off the bat. Right. Well, it's entry level artist stuff. So right. Yeah. Whatever they want. You but at to least do. you get you get to work on some pretty cool projects. He got to, he got to work on some stuff. What was it? He would. I, I do remember what he was working on because it was. Uh, it was with Schwarzenegger. Right. He's in that one. So he's he was freeze. So he, he freezes everyone and he's got <clears throat> they had everyone encased in ice. Mm. So he was making those dummies. So he was helping with all that. Not by himself. Like it's a team of people that do it. And so, um, yeah, he was helping with that. And he was like, oh, let's go see the movie. Um, so it came out and we went together. And I was being as supportive as I possibly can for my friend. But I just remember sitting there going, this is the shittest movie I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. I was like, I'm going to walk, dude. This is so bad, oh this movie. Oh, my gosh. And he was like, I know, this is, this is crap. But uh, that was his first gig. And then saw so my first gig. And like I said, we were blanket bombing the entire Los Angeles. Of, yeah, well, you were pretty much shotgun approach. Let's just see what sticks. I think it was more than shotgun. It was literally napalming everybody. <laughs> like we just came out and we were just like resume, phone call. And to the point where I would just stop sending resumes and I was cold calling. Yeah. Got anything? Got anything? Did like, that work better for you? Yeah. Yeah. Th well, I mean, sure. The first gig was uh, uh, free work. And I was like, okay, that's something. Mm. And it was for this company called Makeup Effects Lab. And I went in there and they, um, they're like, oh, what's your skills or whatever? I'm like, yeah, just entry level, whatever you got. I'll sweep the floors. Okay. So they go, we need you to go upstairs into our storage 
And then there's all these puppets up there. We need to bring them down and we're going to dismantle and take all the animatronics out of them. Mm. So we need all the receivers and servos, I think they wanted. I think the radios, though. Anyway, so they wanted all that stuff. And I pulled them down and I'm looking at them. And it was um, from the Super Mario Brothers movie. Oh, cool. And it was all the the Goomba Goombas and the <laughs> little, I don't forget what they are, but all those those weird little Super Mario characters. And they're all puppets. And I was like, wow, this is cool. And what was neat about it, learning experience, is I was reverse engineering it. I was like, oh, that's how that jaw mechanism works. That's how they do those eyes. And, and right, it, yeah. So I was, you know, talking to the senior artist there. I'm like, oh, that's how you do that. And they're like, yeah, they were really open about it. And like, cool, you're keen to learn. So, so tear it apart. Here's a pile for those. And then we'll get another job for you. And it was painting. I can't, I think I found it once, but it was a hostess cupcake commercial. And it's like, you know, brown chocolate cake. And it's got this white sort of swirl thing on top of it. Yeah. Very distinctive. And these aliens have these snoots and then they suck the, the cream out of the. Oh, the, cool. The, yeah. So these really cool looking purple aliens. And so um, I got to help paint those, which was really neat. Yeah. And that was still doing the free work? Or? That was all free work. Yeah. That so was all within a week. Within so, a week of you like getting the phone book and doing all that. Yeah. So I started at that place on a Monday. No, no, no. All that. No. that From getting the, the phone book. But getting the gig, I mean. I would say by the time I got that first gig, it was about four weeks. That's really not that long. That's when you think about it. Like from sort of having nothing to then being straight up hustling. You don't have that much money in your in your pocket. Yeah. And you're just like, let's just make it happen. Yeah. And a lot of people wouldn't go for the free work, but would you say that that was a key mouse, I guess, step forward? To yeah. Get I, I get to a lot paid of work. I get a lot of students um, come through me and they, and they, ha- it, you could tell mm. the money will come. Yeah. It's the passion. If you yeah. want to learn, come to my shop and we'll, I'll put you on something. And then eventually, you know, it's always worked out. Like, stay. Mm. We got a job for you. You know, get yourself an ABN or whatever. And then yeah. you're, now, uh, now I can pay you. And boom, and there you go. And it's the it's the ones with passion, the ones that are keen, the ones that have knowledge of the industry too. Because mm. then I can kind of bang, you know, just kind of say things that, and they get it, you know, yeah. either yeah. it's on a rudimentary level. But um, sometimes when students come right out of like makeup school. I'll ask them like what movies they watch and and if they know these particular artists in the industry. And a lot of times they don't know. They're just kind of like, oh, it seems cool that title to have a special effects title. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, it's good to know where everything comes from. You know? Yeah. I think, I mean, back then when you had the phone book that you could utilize to find mm. contacts, I mean, now you've got IMDb Pro. I think it's almost easier now because you can literally go, okay, Hills Have Eyes. Mm. It was, you have all these people on board. What are yeah. they working on next? Let yeah. me send them an email and go, hey, this is my portfolio. I don't know what, how easy works now for people. I think it's still, you got to have the drive mm. and the hustle. I think... How you get there? I, I think it's easier that you can directly contact an artist. Yeah, way easier than it was back then. Like, you can go to any one of us now. You know, you can say like Odd Studio down in Sydney. Mm. You can contact. You can basically go to Instagram and go right to the owners of the company and go, "Hi guys." Yeah, and they'll respond to you. You know, and they're because they're cool guys and they'll say hello. But you can kind of have that communication where back then you didn't have that it was very like it's a there's a wall there's a door there's a, a reception usually and yeah. you gotta get and, and that was intimidating. the thing you gotta get through the receptionist too. you gotta you gotta sweet talk all the girls in the front office like i oh, can you just show them my resume yeah <laughs> you know? right well so so you got those first few gigs and then yeah. obviously you've been in the industry for like 20 plus years so oh. obviously the the big the bigger credits would have come later as your career sort of progressed yeah. but i'm sort of interested to know when the ball really started rolling for you did someone sort of see your work and you know like, chad you you're know gonna, what? you're gonna be like this is there's no way that's possible so <laughs> the next story from the free work yeah. to getting fired from the, the dog food place to going, what am I doing with my life? This is all within like a few weeks. Yeah. And I get a, I get a phone call from a lady and she's like, hey, we got your resume. 
Um, we need you to come to Sony Studios in Culver City and meet us at this production office, da 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 da, mm. on this day. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, what is this? And she goes, well, I'll tell you when you get here. And so I drive there, and it was like we said, we <laughs> we lived in San Diego to LA, and it's like, oh, it's a good two hour drive. Yeah. And LA traffic is even nuttier. So I make my way there, park in the parking ramp that they have, and then walk through the gate of Sony Pictures, which is the old MGM studios, like Wizard of Oz and all that stuff was filmed. So I'm walking and it's all these beautiful tan stages, all the great big sound stages. And I'm like, holy hell, what have I, what is this job I just got? And I'm dressed nice, like, you know, like I'm going for a job interview. I have no idea what I'm going in for. I yeah. really don't. Because I, like I said, I bl- blasted people with resumes. I don't know whose desk landed on. And so I make my way to this production office and the lady is like, oh, hi, Chad. You know, and there's these two other young, young guys with me. And they're like, okay, you two. The other guys go, oh, you guys want to be with production? So you hang here. Chad, we need to take you down to stage nine and you can meet the amalgamated dynamics guys i'm like oh that's amazing so, oh, cool. so that's adi and they're um that's uh, alec gillis and tom woodruff jr their their credits are like huge so they did um you know like alien three and they did you know uh death becomes her and th- this is before I got there, so I'm trying to think of their credits before me. But anyway. <laughs> you so I walk, took over after. Yeah, <laughs> I, so I walk in, and I'm like, holy crap, this is amazing. And it was um, the bugs from Starship Troopers. Whoa. So the first job was Starship Troopers. and That's uh, cool. And I'm like, holy crap. And then they're like, she's like, oh, this is Yuri Everson. He's the supervisor here. He's in charge of you now. I'm like, amazing. So they put me on payroll. And my first job was basically just standing next to the supervisor and going, what do you want me to do? And so, yeah. Holy crap. Wait, Starship Troopers. Is that with the spider looking things? Yeah, those bugs. Those, oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. Big I love sci-fi that movie. Movies. I mean, like, probably if you watch it today, it'll be like a little. It, <laughs> I still look. Does I, it, did it, in your eyes, does it, does it age well? You know, all this. I think it effects? does. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it, it does. Um, I love the, 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 the goo, you know, and like the, the spider, like. Pretty much someone's like stuck there and then yep. I think it was a guy maybe and then he gets his head like yeah and but he has like for a while there's that big old goo and like, that's right it's all like gross and whatever yep. well, what's that made out of like sugar syrup or something so <laughs> slime is made from the material called methacellulose Whoa. and it's like a it's a it's a food thickener basically oh uh, wow okay you know you know what metamucil is or, uh, <laughs> for like your guts so no so you mix it up and you drink it and it helps you poop oh oh right right right, right, right. so <laughs> so it's that stuff. it's basically that stuff oh okay so you really don't want the actors to eat any of that no no but, they'll um, shit themselves yeah, like they'll, in the middle of a they'll, take they'll, they'll shit themselves for sure <laughs> um and we don't want that no because that's not in the script unless it's in the script but yeah, um <laughs> so which is funny that you say that because you know all these amazing puppets are in there. They have the brain bug, mm. if you remember that thing, and it stabs I you. I do. It stabs you in the head. Yes. With this thing that comes yeah, out of its yeah. vagina mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and then it comes out and stabs. Um, no. I think Pat- it, it, Patrick it does the, the the dude first, and then I think it's one of the other chicks. Yeah. And so the girl's laying there, and that's Denise Richards. Yeah. And she's laying there, and she's got this knife, and she's pinned to the ground with this great big ridiculous you know, monster spike into her leg and she's just calmly laying there. And then, um, <laughs> yeah. And then she cuts the palp off. That's what it's called. And the, oh, yeah, that's and then it, it sprays yeah. all that goo everywhere. Yeah. Well, that's me actually pumping the blood for or the, the goo for that. Mate, that is amazing. That wow, is full amazing. Circle. That was my full. That was my first effect ever. That is cool. Yeah, and I was spraying that goo all over the set and her, which was amazing. So, has have the mechanics of that stuff sort of evolved a lot since you sort of started your career? Like, <clears throat> is it a lot fancier now? Is it easier to to, to achieve those effects? Yeah, because they kind of went to CGI now. So a lot of the the nineties were the basic the end of the nineties into the the very beginning of the two thousands. The mist. Frank Darabont, he was just like, 
at K and B when I worked for K and B effects, uh, I overheard him say, you know, it's like, let's see some of the puppet stuff that you guys have, but mostly it's going to be CGI that, that huge thing in the, mm. in the show. But, um, all the stuff reaching underneath the the doors and stuff like that. So that was the kind of effects that we were doing for that. But that was for me, that was probably the last big creature thing that I did. The one just before that was Tremors, the TV series. I, I worked on that and that was fun because it was big puppets and, mm. you know, but now they don't do that. Now you don't get all the big puppets. I, I don't, I couldn't tell you the last time I saw a big monster puppet. Yeah. Does that frustrate you that it's going more to CGI? Um, yeah, because it's not re- it's not a real thing. Mm. Um, I think what's fun is it's the the real things that like you can go in and touch that thing. Like, yeah. oh, well, there's that there's that that monster head, or there's that hand, or there's that that weapon, and yeah. you can actually physically hold it. Like, oh my god, that was in the scene. You can't go up and pet. Yeah, that's true. A CGI thing. Yeah. How do you own that thing? You know, it's sitting inside the computer somewhere, you yeah. know, that's true. It's not a real, the practical definitely is better in my opinion. Yeah. I think people are sort of over CGI a little too. I mean, I might, I might be generalizing here, but I, I, I really miss sort of a lot more practical based horror. I think it's just more yeah. effective. I think it is. And I think actors, uh, react better to things that are in front of them and that they can yeah. touch too. Instead of like a tennis ball. Yeah. I yeah. mean, um, when I, I did work on The Hobbit <clears throat> and I just remember, like I was, you know, had a little bit of, I, I got excited because I was like, oh great, I get to be on set for The Hobbit. I did some prosthetics for the the dwarves um, and it was a short stint. But I was like, I was excited to go to set. I was like, oh, this is going to be like the Lord of the Rings. And it looked amazing and all the behind the scenes stuff for that. Mm. And then I got to their stages and it was like, well, the only thing that was real was the floor. And everything else is green screen around. Yeah. And I was like, I was a bit disenchanted, really. I was like, mm. I saw behind the scenes footage from the, I think it was the first film where they, they did a lot of sort of the, you know, to make characters look bigger. They had like mm. they were playing with like foreground, scales. Yeah, yeah, scales. They'd yeah. like build miniatures and like yeah. all that sort of stuff, and it, it looked really cool. Yeah. So later on, I guess when they got more budget, they just thought it would be cheaper maybe to do it yeah, with just, green screen. I, I guess. I, I don't guess know. So. The magic's it's, less. It's. All, I think they can fill more things in that 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 background. They can they can you know cut and paste. Groups of ten elves and twenty. Yeah, and just duplicate them. Just bling 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 bling. And they, and we did shoot a lot of that stuff. Like, okay, we're gonna have these guys run in from this angle. Okay, now change a few of those guys and run from this angle. And then, yeah. And then you just that's how they do those big battles. Yeah, I, I definitely prefer the practical. You know, that that's just always better. I yeah, think. I know. Uh, so much better. Well, what <laughs> What would you say is sort of your preferred when it comes to like special effects? Is it is it the blood stuff? Is it building prosthetics? What's sort of like your your favorite thing when it comes on your desk? You're like, hell yes, I can't wait to work on this. Currently on Netflix is Boy Swallows Universe. There's stuff in that that I was asked to do. And it's it's like it's typical practical effect stuff. It's in front of the camera. It's the hardest to do mm. because all the pressure's on. And so there's there's a scene in there that um, happens right in front of the camera and and it's funny is that a practical gag, um, usually we have it set for three, three and out. Yeah. And, but because now it's all digital cameras, they just continuously roll. Let's do it again, Chad. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And we'll get up to like 12 takes for something that's not meant for it. All but right. it's fun. But it's the, the pressure is so much greater now. Because it has to be perfect that oh, many yeah. times. Oh, my God. It's got to be. It's point blank to the camera. Right. You talk about it. I don't mind the spoilers. Well, well, spoiler yeah, so, alert. You know. um, the character Eli Bell, and it happens right away in the, the series, and he gets his finger cut off. But anyway, so he, you know, the Ivan Kroll character, you know, holds his finger out and then has a knife. And you can see he's putting pressure on it. And so I have a, I created a, a rigged knife that bl- the knife bleeds. He doesn't bleed. Well, okay, so then when the moment pressure goes on, it just sort of squirts out. The yeah, so he's putting pressure like this, mm. and 
there, there's blood pooling around it. And so that kind of gives a bit of tension and like, ooh, that knife's sharp. He's going to do something. And then the next scene is bonk, and then the finger pops off. Yeah, cool. And so that's a, a magnetic trick, basically. Oh. Magic's done with magnets. It reminds me a lot of that trick they did in, in Terminator where uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's got his hand out yeah. and he's playing around with all the That's right. the sort of robotic nerves. Yeah. And the way they did that was it was two arms, That's one right. with like a mechanical sort of yep. moving the, the robotic bits around. Yeah. And then it was his arm through That's the, right. like a sleeve. Yep. Uh, I was like, that's fascinating yeah. because I was all in camera and yeah. I just thought that was super, super cool. Yeah, that's and that's the the funnest I find is because tricking the camera <clears throat> right in front of the camera is the hardest thing to do. So mm. it's it's true magic. Um, it's all angles and mirrors and all that smoking crap. So, yeah, um, <laughs> it, it, it really is. And it comes down to orchestrating everybody with you yeah and and going okay how we look which way we looking on this then they'll tell you and mm. you know and you work together you have to yeah that's, that's where you have to collaborate with the director the first ad <clears throat> a camera and watch out for b camera because you'll pick up something you don't want them to see mm. you know but that kind of thing doing an effect in front of the camera is the funnest the hardest the scariest in the most rock and roll thing you can do. I, I feel like you just feel like a superstar if it works. If it works, yeah. If it doesn't, you feel like shit. Like, how are you going to fix that? <laughs> so how do you go about planning it yourself? Because if you, if you mm. when the director says, okay, I want to I wanna cut a finger off or yeah. I want this big monster to like <clears throat> pretty much throw a bunch of crap at this person, you yeah. know, vomit on this person or whatever, and we're going to have two or three cameras. Yeah. Do you have that information ahead of time? You know exactly what the shots Mostly. are? Yeah, usually. If they if you don't get that, um, you'll get the set and it'll be frustrating for you because mm. you you try to orchestrate and you try to communicate what it is that you needed. And if that gets changed, it's like, well, we put a lot of time into this and, you know, you know, we'd like to have had that information. Like sharing. Share mm. with us. Share with it what your vision is. Yeah. <clears throat> not too often you get one that's gone off the rails and no, we're doing it completely different. But, um, unlike hostile too, um, that was, there was another in the camera gap. Oh my God. That whole movie is in the camera effects. And that was what was fun. And a big one was the Bijou Phillips, um, character. She gets a circular saw to her face and that's all practical. So we did a, uh, like, you know, like you said, Eli Roth comes to us and goes, we need a circular saw to go and hit her in the face and blood needs to spray in a certain way. And then it needs to rip part of her scalp out at mm, the same time. Right. And then she has to be alive and screaming the whole time. Oh, well, OK. Like right. Th that's something we had to work out. <clears throat> and so I asked for a real version. Well, yeah give me a dummy of the circular saw that they're going to plan on using. Mm -hmm. And because it was in Prague or something like that, we had to get their, their thing. So that was sent over. And I basically just gutted the whole thing. So it was just a, a moving wheel. And then I took the, the saw off and I made a, uh, like a disc. Yeah. That, and I drilled all these little holes on top of it. And then I put air to blow onto it so that the, yeah so that it would spin so it's spin cool but, but the actor can control that or i could control it so it was either or and then you just get the air going and it goes <laughs> you know like a little pinwheel and and when they say action the the wheel is safe it can touch her and if it touches her it stops all right like a little fail safe or something yeah yeah so yeah, yeah. it's it just freely moving so yeah. if it touches her it, she stops it and doesn't cut her yeah <clears throat> and then when they say action of the blood it's right on top of her and it just sprays a perfect line so it looks like it slices her face open because it's covered in blood yep and also the saw is obscuring any anything so if her face is there, yeah, and it's so, like, and again, it's the camera angle it's all just to angles. make sure. Yeah. 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 And then so how'd you then do the scalp bit? So then there's a fishing line with a prosthetic of her scalp. And then on action, I'm running the saw. Then Mike McCarty 
he was a supervisor on it on action. He, he yanks the skull through it and it go and it gets tied up into the thing. Goes, oh, and that's what's supposed to stop the blade. That is so cool. <clears throat> so, which is really rad. However, that shot took four times, and each time it took forty minutes to clean her up. And what happened was the angle was wrong. So the camera comes in and the actors was this way and whatever. The angle was off enough mm. that it was showing how the gag worked. And McCarty, you know, pulled Eli aside and say, hey, look, give us one more shot at this. But you have to move your camera. And that's a big ask. Yeah. And so had the little powwow and the trust of us. And he goes, OK, let's do it. He moved it and closed that that window in, the, in in the angle and got it. And her reaction was perfect. And that was the shot that you see. And it was really, really quite horrifying. You know, she's covered in, I mean, just, you know, dark blood. And, yeah. you know, and it was a, it was a really, really good moment. And then the crew applauded us. So that was really fun to have that reaction to. So everyone knew that it worked and it looked right. And so, yeah. That's so cool. So that's when it's fun. See, I don't know if that the VFX guys get that kind of, you know, applause yeah. for their work. I mean, they do great work, but it's like you don't get that in front of the camera sort of reactions of the crew. So mm. have you ever had a, a moment when even the crew freaked out thinking that it was too real, maybe or or maybe they thought yeah. it was real. They had no idea that something was happening. Uh, same movie. Heather, she's hanging upside down. She's completely nude. And there's it's the bathroom scene and then there's a, a, a naked woman <clears throat> underneath and she's cutting her she's cutting her slicing her up and um she's just pouring blood but she's screaming bloody murder mm. and it was pretty upsetting to all of us on the set yeah it, it was been. just so intense yeah like she's screaming you know upside down nude Totally vulnerable, you know? Yeah. And there's this horrible, bloody scene. And I have this <clears throat> blood rig basically at the, you know, at her butt, her lower back. And I'm just pumping, you know, liters and liters of blood. So it's just spraying all over the set. And yeah, it was quite wow. intense. Is there like a like a bucket at the bottom to like collect stuff? Like, no. how do you guys deal with that? Do no. you recycle the blood? <laughs> no. Um <clears throat> you, you've, you spoke about Josh Hale and House of Inequity. He, he's in his movie. He's he wanted to do a lot of throat sl uh, slashes, so um, he contacted us and goes, "Hey, I want to do three throat slashes in this film." I'm like, "Okay, those are that's big." <laughs> and he goes, "One of them, you know, is directly at the camera, and and um, she cuts him, and he just bleeds out." I'm like, "Sweet." I'm like. So on the day we get in there and we're all, you know, it's all set up, ready to go. You know, it's very nervous energy. It's an indie horror film. And it was, you know, three, two, one action, hit the blood and the cut and the, the bleeding happened perfectly. And I always just, I kind of look at what's happening here. And then I look at the, I'm watching the director, Josh too, and I'm pumping the blood and I had, you know, it's a rhythm you do. So yeah. It's like, so it's like with the heart. <clears throat> kind of. It's yeah. just like, ch -do, ch -do, yeah. ch -do, you know. It could go ch -ch 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 or whatever you wanted to do. You know, yeah. you make it up, but it's got to have a little interview, little intervals into it. Yeah. And uh, I'm just looking at him and there's nine liters in this fire extinguisher that I use. And I'm just looking at him and he's just like, keep going, <laughs> keep, going. keep going, keep going. And I flooded his set with nine liters of blood. Oh, my God. And I'm like, I just emptied that. I go, I've never emptied one of those for a, for a shot. He goes, That's all. that was amazing. That was so amazing. I'm like, okay. I'm like, we got to clean this up now. And it was, you know, nine liters and they're trying to get it out the side of the barn. And it was, it was quite funny. I'm like, I'm not cleaning that up. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So that's the other thing too, is how it's not really up to me to contain it. I usually talk to someone that's in the sets and locations and just go, look, you'll need to make some sort of catch. Yeah. It gets everywhere. <laughs> and it's like sticky consistency usually, it isn't is it? Yeah. Sticky, yeah. Yeah, the, the the fake blood. Yeah. It's, um, it's got a little bit of uh, sugar I did into it. I, I did like a, a very simple throat slash in my short film that'll come out very soon. Mm. But I'm interested to hear sort of what your what your base is for like when you want to create something like that, especially to those listening that might have an interest in 
doing that and having a throat slash. Having a throat slash. Well, um, <clears throat> I always say even to the NIFA students, so the New York Film Academy students, I, I speak to them every once in a while. And what I usually recommend to them is if you want to you know, do something like that is talk to a professional like myself or whatever and just go, what would that cost? How do we how do we go about it on all the levels of the budget? Yeah. You know, <clears throat> um, you know, I can charge anywhere from five grand for something like that. It all depends on the complexity. Yeah. How close we are. Yeah. What we're doing. That's it. OK. Yeah. Because if it's like a super tight shot, that needs to be perfect yeah you know whereas if you're more in a wide or a mid you can get away with a couple you know bits. Dark, you can hide a, a potential little tube or something like that yeah you know? um you the prosthetic usually goes under the chin up to there and then well underneath the 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 shirt usually because girls usually have you know a low cut sort of top and most films <clears throat> so you really you have to go beyond everything mm. and you gotta hide so much yeah and that's the trick. You got to hide everything under wardrobe and behind hair. That's nice. a good one too. You know, I have to ask that. It's like, okay, is the girl's hair down? Great. Yeah, because if they have their hair up, that's a struggle. Then I, got, that's then I have edges struggle. there. I got to worry about and yeah. where that tube might. It's you got to think all that. You got to plan all that. So if you if there's a chance to cover as much as they can, great. Because I get calls for like even dummies, you know, of, of people. And the big question is like, well, how much are you seeing? And they're mm. like, well, she's in the bathing suit getting pulled out of the water. I'm like, oh, that's gonna, <laughs> that's cost you more always because I have to make the Pretty dummy much everything, everything. Right? So, yeah. But if I go, if they go, oh, well, it's the middle of the winter. She's got a full jacket on and you'll just see her face. Yeah. Then that means then you just have to focus on the face. Yep. I guess for like for people that want to make films, depending on what your budget is, just write it into the script, like yeah. so that you can you can get away with a lower budget. Yeah. Um, so put them in full clothing and and neck scarves. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> in the middle of summer. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, but whatever. It, it works for the budget. Um. But yeah, with like neck slashes and stuff like that, you know, I I do teach courses on that. I have mm. a, a course that I teach called Bloodlines, Bladders, and Blow Up Heads. Cool. And I teach it probably. Oh, well, four times a year, and it's for all filmmakers, from makeup artists to hobbyists to people just curious how the hell you do this stuff. And I show different aspects, like you start with how to make blood all yeah. the way to blowing up a zombie head. So I show you how to do all that stuff in a, in a one-day workshop. So That's cool. Yeah, so I show you, like, and, they'll, and, and students smartly will ask, well, how much does that ga gag cost? This would cost five hundred bucks. How much does that gag cost? Two ninety nine because I got it up at the Woolies or something like that. Mm. You know, now just show like if I go to Coles or Woolies, I can make blood for under twenty dollars, and that'll wow. that'll cover what you need for here. And then you go, all right, I need. You know, you just you do the math. You start adding yeah, up what yeah. you need. It gives them a business sense as well of totally. what they could charge, you yep. know, put the markup on, blah, blah, blah. That's right. Yeah, so yeah. They, they get an idea. It's like, oh, OK, great. And then I tell them, you know, my little secret, some of my secret formula, all the formulas are out there for blood. So that's not a hidden secret anymore. It yeah. used to be. A blood and recipes used to be like under lock and key. Like that's I just buy it from the reject shop when it's on special on Halloween. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I find it a little bit too Kung Fu-y, you know, like that really bright. Oh, you don't have Yeah, when it's color. like, when it's really, really red. Yeah. Yeah, you want it to be like a bit more like darkish. Just a little bit of brown into it. Yeah, a little bit yep. of brown, maybe even like little bits of black, you know, yep. when it's like the, the blood sort of like, even when like something gets cut, I think doesn't the body naturally start to thicken it to try yeah, to cover yeah, it up? Yeah, so it, it won't just be yeah. yeah. So it won't just be just like a floating mess, you know? Yeah. So I always add Parisian browning essence to my bright blood, and it's a brown already, so it starts to kind of darken it for you. Yeah. So yeah, there's yeah, there's different nice little, little tip there. Yeah, little tricks like that, which is really handy. Yeah. Or um, uh, soy sauce that'll work too. That's interesting. So you actually do use a lot of like food based. Oh, yeah. Things. Yeah. Is that is that for usually for the safety of the act, like the actors as well? So that they if they did Mostly. consume it, it's yeah. not too Mostly dangerous for their skin, for their. Yeah. If they um, ingest it by accident. Mm. 
sometimes you buy um, or make blood and it'll have, uh, you know, detergents in it mm. to keep it from staining. And that's not really good for eyes and mouth. So you have to kind of know what. Yeah. What the purpose what is. What goes where, you know, and and then is that going to be accidentally ingested or shot into someone's eye? So, yeah, <clears throat> there's a there's a really great um, Tom Savini I mentioned before. He has a little behind the scene talk on this Netflix show called um, Movies We Grew Up With. And it was a horror edition with Friday the 13th. And he talks about blood in that. And then there was a detergent in there. It's called Photo Flow. And this mm. is an old Dick Smith trick. It's a, it's a clear detergent. It's very, very, um, got high viscosity to it. So it's really, really slippery. And uh, it's great for non staining. However, it'll make you go blind and it also numb Whoa. your tongue if it gets on your, your tongue. And it accidentally got into an actor's eye on the Friday the 13th, part four, I believe. Blood got into the actor's eye and blinded him oh. temporarily. But it's like, how scary is that? That's it's on the Netflix show, so I'm not speaking out of, out of, out of school here. But Yeah, that is scary. But that's, that's stuff that those guys had to learn, too. It's like, oh, let's get this stuff, and then we'll make our own blood, mm. and that'll be fine. That'll be fine. And then yeah. it's like, ooh, I was a bit too cowboy with that. Yeah. And you got to watch out because you don't want to injure an actor because that could take them out of the production. Yeah. Like, or sorry, or it actually him. hurt somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but the production is thinking, oh, oh my God, we lost that person. For, yeah, no, you know. that's it. That's, that's and very then they're true. Going, I can't see it for the rest of my life. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Hey, maybe you win an Oscar. Now, horror films don't win Oscars. No. <laughs> no oh, gosh. Um, Chad, how do you choose your, your projects? Like, if something comes mm. to your desk, do you have. Do you have like a checklist you go through? Like now that you've been at this for a while, no. you know, are you picky about your projects? What is I can't it? be anymore. Um, in Australia, as a uh, as a business person, I have to kind of I have to take everything that comes to me. Mm. Um, I wish I could be choosy. I wish there was enough work like that where I could yeah. be yes and no on on stuff. Um, I mean, there's I guess there's morals. I suppose if there was a particular effect. That I'm not keen mm. on doing yeah, something, fair enough. <clears throat> children or some something, you know, that I'm just I'm not into that. Um, but uh, yeah, I take everything that kind of comes my way. You know, I'm happy to sort of try and make that work. You yeah. Know? Uh, whether I'm making props for films, you know, whether it's you know a ton of fake knives and guns, or you know, <clears throat> like you and I were talking before, like just random stuff in a room that you know, breakaway glass and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's, that's fun to make. Um, and if it's effects stuff, I get excited because if it's a, a horror movie or a sci-fi and it's like, great, this is my wheelhouse. Yeah. And with sci-fi it's great because it's all prop and usually some sort of creature with it and it's all very brand new. So it's very design heavy. So, you know, you really got to think out of the box and not copy the things that you're into. Like, all the alien movies or whatever the hell it is. Yeah. You know, so it's like, okay, you know, whatever that thing was supposed to be some sort of transponder or whatever it is, you got to come up with it. And that's fun. I like all that. That's cool. Yeah. Do, you, do you prefer the, the low, <clears throat> do, you prefer, do you prefer the low budget end of town because you get more freedom maybe? Or like what sort of uh, the... In between. Netflix shows are really good. Yeah. Because they're kind of in that sweet spot of, they're not, huge budget and usually the um designers it depends what it is obviously it's pertaining to the show um give me a bit of freedom yeah you know what i mean like for example boy swallows universe <clears throat> there's there's a stuff at the very end of it that's very heavy me okay i won't tell you what that is <laughs> yeah, no spoilers please. no spoilers for that <laughs> but um it had a lot of me on that and um yeah, the uh, production designer, um, uh, Michelle McGahey, she's like, Chad, what do you have in your workshop? And I'm like, oh, I got all these molds. I'm like, she's like, great, just bring it all down and we'll just, I'll just have you run parts for all this. I'm like, cool. That's, that's nice. <laughs> and then she just, she's so lovely. She's the, she's the best. And she just goes, that looks great. Change that. Change that color there. That looks disgusting. I love it. And then, you know, you know. 
That's amazing. You got to work fast. Yeah. And as accurate as you can, but you know. That's so good. Chad, what would you say to um, your younger self if you were starting out all again, you know, from scratch or to a younger person that's interested in special effects mm. and wants to make a career out of it? I'm just still on this path of learning and um, I'm not a master at it by any means, but I'm, I tried to like learn everything that's happening with mm. the industry. Yeah. We have so much that's happening. Like when I started, it was <clears throat> just foam latex is our rubber, you know, and it's moved, it's graduated into silicons that are super realistic and, mm. and move. And, and now, you know, with this, with the advent of like, um, 3d printing and, and all this sort of thing, it's moving so quickly. So there's a lot of now what we were scared of this big, scary CGI thing now is can be our friend because we can scan, we can scan you, Deborah, mm. and get every detail of you on a scanner. Yeah. And we can 3d print you by the end of the week and we can get it pretty damn accurate. And it's quite impressive. That's great. And I think, you know, looking back at, myself you know all those years ago when i was like hustling that hustle i haven't really changed that hustle that hustle is still in me yeah. like i'm <clears throat> i'm still after it and i tell all my students like get after it like if you want it you you'll go you'll go get it and i tell the young ones get used to sleeping out of uh, a suitcase and living in weird towns and traveling all over which is will happen to you if you want it to. Yeah. That's what led me to Australia. I just kept saying yes. Mm -hmm. And um, wasn't afraid. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, what? So that story, you know, how did I get to Australia too? Like <clears throat> Greg Nicotero and Howard Berger from KNB Effects, they would have morning meetings. And one of the meetings was, oh, so we have this job that's on our table. Um, it's called The Pacific, and it's a World War II show. It and, uh, you know, everyone's just standing there with their arms folded, like this board. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and they're like, uh, would anybody be interested in going to Australia for the job? And everyone just kind of looking around at each other and like no one was really interested. And I was like, well, how long is it for? And he goes, a year. I'm like, so I thought about it and I went up to their offices. I'm like, I'm interested in the job. And then long story short, two of my best friends were interested in it, too. So we... We help sort of coordinate all these dummies and not people we work for, but these, <laughs> dumb, these prosthetic <laughs> dummies. And um, we, yeah, we shipped off, you know, probably three months later and we are uh, in Australia and meeting up with the uh, Australian effects guys here. Yeah. And, and then you won an Emmy for it. We won an Emmy for Which it. Which is crazy. It's just that thing of saying yes. Yeah. And just backing yourself. And, and I... I, you know, I, I look at this sort of stuff, too, as, like, put yourself into deep water. Yes. And that's okay. Yeah. It is okay. It's scary as hell. You get better, too. You'll get better. Yeah. And you will sink. and But you'll you'll find a way to get to the top. And that's okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? And always, put, like, I'm still trying to put myself in deep water. Yeah. And, I, you know, I got stuff coming up this year that I'm really excited for. And, I, and it's like, I, you know, just put myself, keep putting myself out in deep water. I'll be okay. There's, there is no safety net. Yeah. You don't know what's to happen. I love that. You know what I mean? So I just say, you know, whatever I was doing, I'm still doing it, but I'm, I'm just a little bit more focused because I didn't know the world then. Mm. So, you know, but that, you know, that's, that's my opinion of how. No, you that's know. fantastic. Yeah. So you've got Furiosa coming up, I think. Yeah. Little birdie told me. Furiosa is, I think, slated for May. I think I saw the release for that. Yeah. So that was good for us. That was a um, a lot of stunt dummies for that because mm. so, it's one of those shows where it's just stunt heavy. And so they can't really hurt real stunties. Yeah. They don't have enough of them. So they hurt our dummies, which, <laughs> which is fun. That's cool. Yeah. So we made uh, uh, a team of of dummies to send to to the set for that so that was a good one for us yeah you got la brea as well i did la brea last year i think that it may have kicked off now i think it was last week mm, yeah the last season yeah so season three was shot <clears throat> just up in uh yatla not too far away stapleton and uh yeah fun props for that prehistoric it's like that sort of prehistoric and 
futuristic sort of yeah they they have a, a weird blend but it's cool it's yeah, very, very it's, interesting do you remember that tv show terra nova yes it's like a lot like that i found because I, I did work on that too but i was like this has that it has that same sort of vibe yeah that vibe of prehistoric that's you know primitive stuff and then uh you know sort of modern you know tools and things so and my last question is what's your favorite uh special effects creature it's it's a toss-up between the incredible bits of the thing there's you know so many aspects of that but more than anything it's it's the the uh american werewolf and werewolf uh werewolf so cool yeah i think that's my favorite it's the scariest that one scared the hell out of me so amazing chad thank you so much for joining the podcast this was amazing such a great chat well thanks for having me boom and we'll see you in the next one (laughs) 